Anybody get been getting excited about heaven? Yeah. Yes. 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 All right. Hold up. This, this week's topic, uh, we've been talking about heaven. We talked about judgment. We talked about Jesus coming back. We talked about giving new bodies. Everybody excited about that? I'm excited about that. And then this week's topic for heaven is... Hey, oh, my pen. Thank you. Uh, this week's uh, topic of discussion about heaven is going to be a new heaven and a new earth. Oh, nobody cheered for that one. They're like, all right, no, no, another thing. Woohoo! No, a new heaven and a new earth. And so we're going to be looking at uh, one of the texts we're going to be at is Romans chapter 8. So if you want to kind of get ahead of, your, ahead of the game, you can turn to Romans chapter 8. Put, maybe put your thumb or your finger in there. And we're also going to be looking at Revelation chapter 21. And that's the, that's the scripture that we're end up going to start with. But I love, and the reason why we've been talking about heaven is because I want us to be free from fear and full of hope, full of confidence, full of anticipation. You know, when we're going through life and life throws at us, last week we talked about Paul saying that we live in this body of decay. We've got heaviness on us. We go through life. Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 talked about being beat, struck down, destroyed, been in poverty, and goes into chapter 5 saying, well, the reason why I can keep on going in all of this is because I know the hope that I have. Well, that's why we're talking about heaven, so that we can have hope, that we can be free from all fear, and we can be filled with hope, have confidence, with anticipation that, hey, God's got everything in control. And hopefully, as we gear our mind towards that, having that hope and living in that hope, that we would live for different treasures here on earth. Then that 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 reason, that that's that thing in our hearts that we're full of hope, we're looking towards what we have in the future, then when we live this life, we live for a different purpose. I've been struck by and I've been meditating on that the whole time, looking at Paul's life and saying how much he was destroyed and he was struck down and he was defeated and thinking about uh, the fact that he did all that and kept on doing it because he had the hope. And I said, man, if we as a church body were to have that same hope, man, we would live for a different treasure. We would live not for the treasure of this earth, but we would live for heavenly things. We wouldn't be sidetracked by the fleeting attractions of sin, but no, we would be looking all for God's glory. And in Romans chapter 5, verse 2, we would be so in awe of God's glory that we wouldn't envy sin anymore. We wouldn't fret failure. We wouldn't um, fret what people would think about us, what people would say about us. Man, we would just be all for what God has for us. We would devote ourselves to heavenly treasures, living for Him, living for that glory that we talked uh, about last week. We would love our enemies. We would bless others. We would do good. We would share all of our possessions. We would have everything in common. Man, we would, there would be no more hate. There would be no more anger, right? If we would just think about heaven, we would get rid of all offenses, we would get rid of all, all of the things that, that sidetracked us because we would just be focused on what God has for us. All of this flows from us getting a hold of the hope that we have. It frees us to live, to live for Jesus the way that he would That's have right. us to live. So we're going to end up in Romans chapter 8, but let's first talk about Revelation chapter 24. So let's, let's turn there together. Because we're talking about heaven, we're talking about all these uh, 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 eternity things. We've got to figure out oh, what is it all going to end up? Where, where is it going to all look like? And hopefully today we paint the picture of, of what it's all going to look like. And there's different scriptures. There's a few uh, problems maybe posed in scripture when we talk about the new earth and the new heavens. And so we're going to start in, verse, uh, in Revelation chapter 21 before we go to Romans chapter 8. Because Romans chapter 8 answers some of the questions that Revelations brings about. Talking about that is this earth going to be destroyed or where is this heavenly eternity going to be taking place? Is it going to be here on earth? Is it going to be up in clouds? Are we going to fly around with harps and wings? 
Or are, 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 are we going to live eternity? Or what is it going to look like? Where is it going to be? So let's look at Revelation chapter 21 right here. John says that this new earth, John is the author of Revelation. He's the writer of Revelation. John says that a new earth and a new heaven will come down and God will make his eternal dwelling among us. So let's look at this. Revelation chapter 21. Verses 1 through 4, it says this, Then I, that's John, he said, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old, for the old order of things has passed away. For the old order of things has passed away. And in this scripture, if you're not familiar with Revelations, I encourage you to read the book of Revelation. But even at the beginning, there's talked about, uh, sorry, in verse 1, it talks about that there will no longer be a sea. There is a sea of glass that separates, uh, it talks about the sea of glass that separates God's throne from, from all around him. It says, this will no longer be there. God will now be with his people. So the first heaven, so this problem here a little bit, the first heaven and the first earth, it passed away. So I, I kind of was questioning, I'm like, okay, so what will be done away with? What is, what is, is it like everything's going to crumble, everything's going to melt, the universe has it held together at all the planets, and everything. Will, it, will it go away? Will, will God start over? Will he annihilate everything? And then, then it's going to be like a new spoken word comes out, a new Genesis chapter one kind of, kind of moment. Well, today I'm going to argue, as I've looked at the scripture and I'm comparing with Romans chapter 8, that, that it's actually, it's a continuation. This is a continuation of the present creation, even though in scripture, we're going to look at these different words, it talks about destruction, it talks about passing away. So how is this a continuation of what there is, even with this idea of it being destroyed? So John says here that it's going to pass away. But in Peter, uh, in 2 Peter, Peter describes it with even more graphic terms than just passing away. So let's look just briefly here at 2 Peter chapter 3, and we're going to look in verse 10. So 2 Peter chapter 3, and starting in verse 10, this is how Peter describes this ending of things as they are. It says this, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth, and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives. As you look forward to the day of God, and speed is coming, that the day will bring about the destructions of the heavens by fire and by elements that melt with the heat. But in keeping with this promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So the new heaven and the new earth that we are anticipating and we're looking forward to and we're heading toward is a new heaven, new earth, and I love how it says this, where righteousness dwells. In Revelation chapter 21, it repeats the same thing in verse 10, that these things will pass away, right? Second Peter says in verse 10, they will pass away. And in three times, it describes this destruction of earth in these matters, in intense heat, to be destroyed in verse 11. Verse 12, it will be destroyed by burning elements that melt with intense heat. So will the earth and heaven, so everything that is on land, everything in the sky, 
Will it be totally done away with? Will God completely start over? What does this pass away mean? Does it, so I do not believe that it means that it will go out of existence or that it would, that it would change its present condition as pass away. So just like a, a caterpillar goes out of existence, right, when it becomes a butterfly, or just as a tadpole, right, will go out of existence because it then becomes a frog, or if we have natural disasters, like we talked about the fires right now in Redding, California, where they have, when we talk about that, it's like they've destroyed thousands of acres, thousands of, of buildings at this point, and destroyed landscapes, or maybe if we're a little wiser in the room, we can remember Mount St. Helen erupting, and it destroying Mount St. Helen and all the things around it. But now we can go back to those places, we can go to Mount St. Helen area, Right in California, that's a really uh, immediate disaster. But we can see that things have now come back to life. Or we go down to New Orleans and see the flood after the hurricane and say, wow, they, they've rebuilt, they've, they've come back, everything has come back to life. So even in using this language of destruction or, uh, or things passing away, it, there's still a, a semblance of it still remaining, it's still being there, there's still being life there, there there's still being things that come back. So in Peter's discussion and in John's discussion, both describe an event of destruction, but it's more, as we look at Romans, to find out that it's more of bringing to end this age, that currently how we find things, not putting it out of existence, not wiping it, uh, wiping it all away, but wiping out what it says in Peter, the order, or, in, or again in Revelation, the order, so that all evil is cleansed out of it. The fire, oftentimes in the scripture, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, fire is described as what? As something that purifies it. So this intensity is a, a way of purifying our current creation, our current order, from all unrighteousness, and then bringing about a new creation, a new heavens, a new order. So let's now turn to Romans chapter 8, and I want to give you four reasons why I don't believe everything will be destroyed completely, but rather it's uh, talking about a renewal of things, a things made redeemed, a things made restored. And I believe not only will we find these four reasons in Romans chapter 8, but it matches the story of God. The story of God is this, that in creation, at the beginning of times, he created all things. Man chose his own way, he chose to reject the knowledge of God, and did his own thing. Sin, a curse, came about, uh, uh, came and laid upon mankind, in which then through Jesus Christ, we were redeemed, we were restored into a relationship with Christ. The same thing that we see in the whole story of God is again revealed at the end times, at the end of all times. So let's look here in Romans chapter 8. And in Romans chapter 8, we're going to see that there's, there's uh, reasons to believe, there's a strong, to have faith in saying, no, not all things will be restored, will be annihilated, but rather things will be restored, renewed, redeemed to the way God desired it to be. So Romans chapter 8. Starting in verse 18. It says this, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage of decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who gave the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly 
for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But we hope for what we do not yet have. We wait for it patiently. So we wait for it patiently to receive what God is to do. So let's look at these four reasons why the earth as we know it is not going to be destroyed, annihilated, done away with, and regraded, but rather it's going to be set a new order in the new heaven and the new earth. The first reason is this, that God subjected creation in hope. Verse 19 and 20. For the creation waits eagerly with expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope. So there's this language used here that's kind of like this, uh, this like, and then Christmas morning kind of anticipation of something that's going to come. There's a, there's a hope for it, there's an excitement about it, that all of creation, even though subjected to the curse, even though dealing with the groans, although wanting, uh, although, sorry, walking through life in decay, right, as it was described last week, there's this anticipation that there's something more coming. I don't know about you, but even my small introductions to being uh, dealing with Denver and being a parent, uh, or you guys being around parenting, there is this like excitement. There's things that they get excited about, and there's things they don't get excited about, right? I mean, like working, reading, or doing schoolwork usually doesn't bring that kind of excitement. But man, talking about some kind of reward, whether it be ice cream, whether it be going fishing, whether it be Christmas morning is coming, right? There's this leading forward, there's this excitement, there's a, hey, we're going to go do this. We don't use that, that language when we're talking about a, a, some kind of uh, a complete annihilation, destruction, de destroyed of all things. No, there's actually a, a hoping for that to happen. Because why? Because something new is going to take its place. The curse was not the final word. So the new heavens, the new earth, the new establishment that is coming is this freedom from the curse. Creation is not appointed for annihilation, but I believe it rather is appointed for restoration, and I believe that is what goes aligned with, or in line with, God's character. God is, a, God is the one who redeems and restores. And yes, we know that He brings about judgment. He does have the final say. He is the all-authoritative being who can, just from His holiness, cancel out anything that is against Him. However, we know in all of that, He is bringing about redemption. He is bringing about restoration. And so again here, creation is in hope of this time where all things will be destroyed so that God's dwelling can be among us and He can establish His way and His kingdom. The second way that I see here that it talks against a total annihilation and a recreation, but rather uh, um, that our creation will be made new and be established new is in verse 21. That creation will be set free from corruption. So in this new heaven and new earth, creation will be set free from corruption. Look at verse 21. It's, it's following the hope, and the hope is that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage of decay and brought into the freedom of glory of the children of God. So the creation itself, not only us as his children, but creation itself will also be set free from the slavery of corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. It's not destined for annihilation, but it's destined for liberation. Freedom from slavery and corruption. I mean, like, that's what and who God is. That's what and who the gospel is. Over and over again, as I studied this out this week, I was thinking, 
man, this sounds like the gospel. Like it sounds like it sounds like God. Yes, this is how it's going to be. Purify by judgment, the earth will remain with no more corruption, no more crying, no more death, no more curse, no more sickness, no more disease. All things will be made right. I think this is the clearest way that it's described that the earth is not going to be destroyed or annihilated, but that it will be set free. It will be made right. The new heavens will come when God's, Revelation 21, when God makes his dwelling among us, when he comes and makes his dwelling among us, everything will be made right. Second reason that we'll be free from creative corruption. The third is that creation is suffering in labor pains. It's having labor pains. Verse 22. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in pains of childbirth right up to the present time. This is groaning. It's groaning. Bringing forth a creation. Not doing away with itself. Not rotting. Not an annihilation. But bringing forth a creation. Beautiful creation. Jesus used the same language when he talked in Matthew chapter 24, verse 7 and 8. He said that nations would rise against nations, kingdoms against kingdoms, famine and earthquakes. But all of that would be the beginning of him establishing his kingdom. So now and today, and we said this, you know, I, I said this at the beginning of this series about heaven. I mean, for, for every generation, they have, they're looking at the things that are happening around us. And then there's earthquakes, there's fire, there's this nation against this nation, and this kingdom against this kingdom. And what did we say in, in, in that? In, in that, it's telling us, always be ready. At any moment, Jesus can return, right? That was a, that was a prompting to all of us that, hey, in, in every generation, Evil is increasing. Every generation, there are signs that God is coming back. And, and as they increase, hey, Jesus is coming back. So what is it for us? What is the warning for us? What is the prompting for us as believers? Always be ready. Always be ready. Always be ready in righteousness. The earth is like a mother in this picture, about to give birth to a new earth, where righteousness, the second uh, Peter said, where righteousness dwells, and where God will reign in the midst of his people. Reason number four, earth is not going to be annihilated, but it's going to be established God's kingdom here, is that it describes in Romans chapter 8 again, a redemption of our bodies. Paul's last argument against annihilation is the redemption of our bodies found in verse 23. It says this, Not only so, but we ourselves, so not only so is creation gearing and getting ready for this rebirth, this renewal, but in verse 23 it says, Not only so, but our, we ourselves who have been given the first fruits of the Spirit grow inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. Here Paul connects the redemption of our bodies with the redemption of creation. After, our, after a lifetime of growing in hardship, after a lifetime of going through the mud, after all of that we go through, all the good things and the, and the hard things and everything, we are heading towards this moment of redemption where God restores all of creation and frees us from every ounce of the curse. Anybody else get excited when we think about this? Then every ounce of the curse, again, I repeat this over and over again, but every good thing comes from the Father. So everything that is not good, it comes as part of the curse. I'm looking forward to the day where I no longer have to deal with all the up. Amen. Our bodies are not annihilated, but they're redeemed, they're restored, they're made new, they're not thrown away. Over and over again, we see God is 
establish his new order, his new creation, as we are. And it's amazing. Our, ha our final habitation will be on earth in a new way, in a new order. Matthew chapter 19, verse 28, Jesus calls it the final regeneration when the Son of Man will sit on His glorious throne and creation will be born again. This is what's going to happen when Jesus sits and set up His order. Acts chapter 3, verse 21, Peter calls it the times of restoration of all things of which God spoke of by the mouth of His holy people. So when we look at the New Testament, what's rich about Scripture is that when we look at what the New Testament is, it's not just all the new things that were brought, but it's a reminder of things that were said before. So when Peter is preaching this sermon in Acts chapter 3, and everybody uh, has just been filled with the Holy Spirit, and the crowd that's gathered, and he basically accuses everybody there for crucifying Jesus, and he points back to what was said before that there is going to be a restoration. So let's look again at Isaiah chapter 11. And we're going to see, what did the prophets say about this new creation? How is it going to come about? What is it going to look like? And I love the pictures and the words that they use. Isaiah chapter 11. Starting in verse 6. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 6, it says this. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together. And the little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. The young will lie down together. The lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den. The young children will put its hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The before, at the beginning of time, at the beginning of creation, we rejected the knowledge of God. At the end of time, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord, and it will be accepted. It will be the way. It will be the truth. It will be what we go after. It will be what we stay after. It will be the thing that's in the forefront of our mind. Is everything will be made new. History as we know it will end. The way of life, the way of doing things, the backbiting, the, the wanting up, the wanting revenge, the, the lying to, the deceiving, the hate. It will all end as we are filled with the knowledge of God. I mean, think about all these pictures of the lions, the lambs, the leopards, the goats. The, they're all together. The children will be able to be with us. I mean, like, it's a new way. It's a new life. God will be the center of it all. And we will all be filled with His knowledge. All the curse will be removed and we will be free to reflect on the beauty of the Lord. This is what we have hope for. This is what we look forward to. Jesus returning and establishing His way forever undoing all effects of the curse and annihilating completely anything that has to do with the enemy and restoring us now completely to him. This is what I have hope in. This is what I believe frees us to live for him. This is what frees us to have treasures, not on this earth that we store up for ourselves, but treasures in heaven. This is what, if, hey, when I look at Paul's life, man, we all are like, dude, you're amazing. But we look at him and like, man, he kept going because he knew the hope that he had. Whatever God is asking you to do today, this is what, this is what it's come down to for me. And I believe for us as a church. 
Whatever God is asking you to do today, whatever sacrifice He has asked you to make, whatever calling that He is calling you to, whatever next step in Him that you need to take, whatever it is, it's you are able to do it because you have security of your future is in Him. So no sacrifice is too much, no request is too much, no area of your life that He asks for lordship in it is too much because, hey, I, I know my future is secure in it. We are free, when we understand the hope that we have, we are free to live for Him. That's the goal, that's the intention of these messages about heaven. It is that when we grasp a hold of it, and we know it and believe on it, then we are free to live for Him in any way that He asks of us. So this morning, in closing of this message this week, talking about heaven, talking about newness, talking about freedom from the curse, man, I hope that we all, with anticipation, keep on going. Keep on working towards what He asks us to do. Run with, uh, with inhibition towards whatever He's asking of us. Because, man, when, when we know who has our future, there's nothing on this world that can come again. There's no, no fear can overwhelm us. No weight can outdo us. No, nothing can come because we know, hey, we are secure in Him. Let us live in that security. Let us live in that hope. Let us have that completely in the forefront of our mind so that no matter where He may ask us to go, no matter what He may ask us to do, we say, yes and amen, I know your, my future is secure in you. That's the kind of life we live. This morning I want to pray over us that we will get this truth so deep inside of us that our lives begin to look different because we have a different hope than those who are around us. Our hope is not in earthly things. They're not in relationships. They're not in finances. They're not in where we live and what we have or what we don't have. And our hope is in the security that we have in Jesus and the hope of a future that is renewed and restored and redeemed. Let me pray over you. And then I want to ask you to respond today. And if, if you... In this room, you just need prayer. You say, "Yeah, Andrew, I have a physical ailment. I need prayer that you that this thing would would come and be whole in Jesus' name." And I want to pray with you for that. Or if you say, "Man, this morning you're challenging me with these topics about heaven because I know my mind is not on the hope that I have, and it's causing me to walk to and fro, wishy-washy, not sure about life." And I want to pray that you would have this confidence. So let me bless you this morning. And then may we respond in prayer, asking the Lord to do these things in our lives. Father, Lord, I thank you for your message of hope. Uh, God, that you do have a future of redemption and restoration for those who call on your name. And Father, I'm honored this morning to stand in front of, of your sons and your daughters, ones that call on your name ones that have set their eyes on you, have received redemption through your Son, Jesus Christ. And so, God, I pray now for their hearts. Father, as a song that we sang today, Father, help us to believe the full truth of the gospel, not only that you save us, but, God, that you have a future for us, a future that is full of redemption and restoration and newness and set right, Father, where you rule and you reign. God, as we fix our eyes on that truth, Lord, free us. Free us to live for you, God. Free us to live for your glory, for your purposes, for your kingdom. Lord, let us live different because we have such hope in you. God, I pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen. This morning, I, I don't know... Um, may need prayer, but I, the invitation to you is, come let us pray. If you have a physical need, you need prayer for. If you have something in your life that you're carrying, that you find a burden, then let's pray that God brings His restoration, His glory to bear on your need, and He gives all glory. Amen.